Hello and welcome to Inventive Marketing Club number eight and this one's all about image editing. Um, we're going to be looking at best practices, how to prepare an image for the web or social media and some handy tools and fingers crossed some live demos that will work really well. A um, little bit late today, my apologies, just some technical issues but hopefully you're all still with us which it looks like a, a few of you are which is great. So just a quick sound check, um, just let me know I'm coming through okay, that you can hear everything, that I'm not too glitchy, um, and that it's all good. Um, while you do that, I will just explain to people who are new to the club what it's all about. So this is a webinar, really, and we have one every month. Um, all members um, come and we talk about a topic. I'll lead it, but um, people can fire in questions, and we've got dedicated Q&A at the end. And we cover topics such as we've looked at YouTube stats, email marketing, um, Google Analytics, search optimization, and this one's on image editing and, and processing and that sort of thing. And it all comes from really um, working with clients on a day-to-day -day basis and, and understanding what issues they've got and what, what people can benefit from uh, getting a tutorial of it or just um, sharing it more widely. So that's where we are. Um, I've got no comments to say uh, everyone can hear me, so I assume that's good. Okay, so, so uh, as usual, just fire out questions as and when you have them, and uh, when there's a lull and when I'm coming up to a certain section, I'll be able to go through those questions and fire them back. But a couple I thought might be useful um, to think about is what sort of best image sizes do you need to work with? What platforms, what web platforms or social platforms are you using? Um, taking a look at image compression, really, if you've got any questions on that. And um, and this actually, this is a question back to you guys. What useful tool, tools and apps do you use when you're image processing? So, first thing first, and I think a lot of people may not worry about this. It used to be something that was a bit more of a concern in the past, and that's file formats. Um, a lot of people may, um, in the past, maybe web browsers didn't accept all file formats. They're quite limited to, say, JPEG and, and GIF in the early days. But nowadays, they'll accept most formats uh, in a variety of different sizes and compressions. Um, so we don't need to worry about it too much. However, from my point of view, it's still worth thinking about because there's a lot uh, to be gained from the file size, um, as in the, the amount of space it takes up on disk, uh, and the quality. So it's very much worth thinking about from that point of view. And also, what's the best pixel size? So like the, the amount of pixels that an, an image takes up, what's the best size to work with? Uh, because often I do find uh, people working at very small pixel sizes and then trying to blow it up um, or use it on something where it really needs to be bigger. It doesn't work very well, particularly noticeable in print. But even on the web, if you get a small image coming from a phone, maybe it's been converted a few times or you've just downloaded it from the web and you're reusing it, often they're quite small. So it's something worth paying attention to. So we're going to talk about that. So the first format I want to look at is um, vector and icons and, and those sort of things. So uh, a vector, just to give you a definition, is something where you describe an image in points and then lines. So I've got an example of a, um, an icon, which is a paint fill icon. And we could describe that image by looking at different points going around the edge and then lines to fill those in. And then whether it's got a fill color, what color the lines are and so on. So you're really describing how you might make it up at points, lines and fills and colors. The nice thing about vector is that you can have um, one image that you design once that can be scaled up huge, that would work on a, um, a, a poster on the side of a building, or you can scale it down really small. It's gonna look just as good, generally speaking. I'm not really gonna to talk too much about vector, but I will look at its usefulness and why we might want to think about it for certain um, applications, particularly when we've got something that's already vector to begin with. Um, in this case, these are, uh, this is a, an icon pack that we've downloaded from our image library, and it, it provides them in a variety of different formats, but one of them is a vector format. And if you've got something in a vector format, ideally you want to maintain it in that vector format. And one of the reasons why is size. Now, let me go through the formats here, and you'll see the size differences between the format for actually quite this um, a reasonably simple file here. So the first on the left is JPEG. A lot of you have probably heard of it. Um, I can't remember exactly what it stands for, um, something like Joint Photographic Experts Group. But it's basically um, an image format which allows you to compress the image. 
And by compression, it means reduce the file size. And all that compression does is looks at any commonalities in that image so it can um, not repeat itself and try and save space. JPEG compression works really well. Um, and there's varying, varying different degrees, as we'll see on the next slide. Um, and then we've got PNG. Um, now, PNG stands for Portal, Portable Network Graphic. And, and actually, this can contain two, two formats. You can have um, a vector format, so described in points and lines. You can also have a raster format, which is where you're describing things in just dots and what, where that dot is positioned and what color it is. And that's basically how JPEG works. With PNG, um, it does actually allow us to store some of the vector format in there, um, but it's also fairly good at um, describing. Um, uh, it does have some compression in there as well. But the main reason I would use PNG is it allows us to have a transparent background. So you can see with a JPEG, we've got to have a background of some sort. In this case, it's just white, uh, but we could make that any color. So I could, um, in the image editor, blend that color in to fit the gray background. But with a PNG, you can actually store a transparent background. So you say uh, that background color is transparent. And that's really nice for icons like this because we can have them sitting over the top of another image or color, particularly useful on the web page. Uh, next, we've got structured, um, is it structured vector graphics? <laughs> if, that, if that isn't right, it'll come to me in a minute. Um, but basically, it's a vector graphic format. So it, it natively stores the image, the points and the lines and the colors in that format. So it's rendering it every time. Great on a web page because you can make it really big, really small. It's fairly fast nowadays with modern computers, so it doesn't really slow things down. Um, so in this case, actually, um, that would probably be one of the better formats to store an icon in, particularly if it comes to you as a vector. And the next one along is an EPS, um, encapsulated postscript. I can't, I can't exactly re remember what it is. I don't use it a huge amount. Um, you might find that someone de developing a logo in uh, Adobe Illustrator might provide you with the um, artwork in EPS format. In which case, uh, again, that's points and lines and colors, um, can be scaled up and down. Really useful, but quite big, because it contains lots of additional information, which we generally don't need on the web. And this is primarily where I'm looking at deploying these images. So what we might do is take that original EPS, and then convert it to an SVG, or if you can get that original um, supplied to you as an SVG, which often you can, um, like with these vector icons, um, they were supplied in all these different formats, so I could use whatever I liked here. But most interestingly, the different file sizes for each of these. So we can see the smallest is the SVG at two kilobytes. So that's really small, that's good. That's We want images to be as small as possible because they load more quickly. Uh, the EPS is the biggest, but that's fine. I would treat that as an image that you would store your original graphic or a vector in. Um, and then we've got a PNG at 12 kilobytes, which is pretty good. And then we've got a JPEG. Now, it's, it's um, I can't remember what compression we had on the JPEG there. I think I just left this native. So this is what, what was supplied in the icon pack. Um, in fact, no, we did compress it down a little bit, but it's not brought it down a huge amount. Um, purely because it's just got a lot more work to do there. For such a simple thing, there is a sort of a, an overhead with JPEG, which is not gonna go hugely below. Um, whereas the PNG, it's, it's very simplistic and managed to compress it down a little bit further. But in this case, SVG would be your best bet. Uh, but if you don't have an SVG version, um, a PNG for icons and vector works really, really well. So moving on to raster photos and raster, raster me, rasterized photos basically mean we're looking at the points of a pic, um, points, pixels and colors. And I've, what I wanted to do here is just give an example of a quite a, a large image. So this was from a photo library. It's a, a guy running along a track and the image pixel size is 5,760 by 3,000. 840. Now that's going to likely to be a little bit smaller than the original image. They may have uh, zoomed in and cropped it a little bit, but it's still very large, probably too big for, for putting on the web. But we do want to work with the largest image possible. So any, any uh, image work, whether it's compression, resizing, we're going to play around the colors or add some things over the top, we really want to do it with the biggest possible images to start with. So what I've done in this particular example is shown you how we can compress this image uh, using different JPEG compression formats. And JPEGs can be compressed from 100% all the way down. And the, um, 
I guess it's kind of the other way around. If I have 100%, it means it's the least amount of compression. If I have 20%, it's applying much more um, compression. So uh, if we look at the original one that was supplied in the uh, from the photo library, that's 9.7 meg. Now I've left that as is. I could probably compress that down a little bit further by using some tools, which I'll mention later on, which will remove this additional information. It's stuff you can't see. It doesn't help the image, but it gives you information like what the camera is, where it was taken, who, who the author is, and that sort of information, which you don't necessarily need on the website, and it does take up additional space. Um, it may also be what program last edited and that sort of stuff. If we just nudge it down a little bit to what I use as a typical compression, uh, JPEG 80%, um, that brings us down to amazing 1.4 meg. Now, it's still a large image, but it's a lot smaller. We've reduced it massively just by bringing it down and also reducing the amount of meta information in there. And I'll show you, I keep talking about this meta information. I'm going to show you a really useful tool that can help remove that. But we can make it go even a bit further. So if we bring it down to JPEG 40%, we can get it down to more than half that again at 628 kilobytes. And if we want to squeeze a little bit more out of it, down to 20% where it's 471 kilobytes. And you can see it's almost diminishing returns at that point. It's really starting to get more difficult to get the file space, space back and, and keep uh, an image that looks good. Um, and the one thing you want to be doing really when you're compressing image, an image is trying to strike the balance between the quality to make sure it still looks good to you at the resolution you're gonna display it um, and getting the file size down. Now, in this particular image, it did really well, much better than I thought, because I don't normally go down to 20%. Um, but looking at the image, it might work quite well for compression, because we've got a, uh, the background of the sports field for this runner. is actually a little bit blurred. Now, that works in JPEG's favor. A blurred image is much more easy to compress and doesn't take up so much space. If you think about uh, an image that's highly detailed and it's got lots of contrast, um, maybe something like waves or um, uh, anything really with, lo with lots of detail to it, that's going to give JPEG compression a harder time and it's not going to be able to compress that as much. But if you blur the background slightly and, and maybe use a depth of focus like they're doing in this photo, then that can actually really help and that'll, that'll uh, reduce or allow you to compress an image more. So we've really got the track. Um, which is in focus and, and the guy's legs. And actually he slightly blurs out of focus as we move towards his head. Uh, I know you can't you can't probably see it from this. And as it's coming through the webinar, it's going through its own um, compression anyway. So you're going to lose a lot of the, the fidelity. But um, take it from me, when you look at the image, it's very crisp towards the bottom and, move, and blurs towards the top. That's nice. That works really well and actually works in this in this favor. Um, something I've done uh, is had put a little call out Zoom. And I've brought in the, I think the JPEG in the middle is the 80% version. In fact, no, it's the 20% version. And then I've zoomed into a section of it. Um, just to show you, and you pro again, you probably can't see from here. I might have to actually just share the results of this. Um, one of the things with JPEG compression is it might look fine at the original size, but if you zoom into it, you start to see um, these digital um, compression artifacts. And that's where it starts to... Um, the colors don't look nice, they're not gradiated, they start to look blocky. And that's because the algorithm is making an assumption for how we're going to be viewing the image and uh, getting basically working, trying to get away with as much as possible given how our eyes work to basically trick us into thinking there is maybe a solid color there, but actually it's a little bit blocky. Um, and you don't notice until you zoom in. Um, and even, but even on this image at 20%, because that background is blurred out, it still looks pretty good. But if you were to compare the original to the 20% version, you would definitely see um, there's a lot more blockiness in the image. But that's only when you zoom in. If you don't need to zoom in an image, you don't do it. Something to pay attention, though, if you've got product images and you're using uh, maybe WooCommerce or Shopify, where you can zoom over, hover over the images and it zooms in, um, just make be sure that uh, even though you can supply the images and they're going to be at one size, if you do have the zoom feature, it's going to go at least twice that. So when you supply images into those uh, sort of e-commerce sites, um, you want to make sure you put them in at double the size so they're going to look great when they're actually um, scaled up and you've got the zoom feature. So hopefully that makes sense. Basically what I'm saying here is when you're compressing images, a safe bet is 80%. That's, I think that generally works really well. But if you can, go a little bit further, particularly if you've got 
Uh, a lot of static images on your page, I, you're not going to change them a huge amount. And they're big, you know, maybe it's a big masthead image. If you want it to look great and you want it to um, uh, be fast loading, then optimize it. Just, just try it at different formats until you find something or different compression levels until you find something that works really well. Okay, um, in terms of image dimensions, uh, dimensions, I find a lot of people work with images that are too small to begin with. Um, and it means when they upload them onto their blog, maybe the blog has to expand it a little bit, or it just makes a little bit more. Um, and it's going to look grainy, it's going to look blocky, it's not going to look very nice, particularly if it's been heavily compressed, you're, you're going to start to notice that. Um, Squarespace actually recommends uh, at least 1500 pixels on the smallest edge. And so on the smallest edge, what that means is if you've got a landscape image, so smaller on the on the height than the than the than the width, then you want the smallest edge, which is the height, to be 1500 pixels high. Um, and then it means that the width is going to be, depending on the ratio, much bigger than that. I would actually recommend, uh, certainly if you're working with images and you're doing any sort of image processing, you work with uh, 3000 pixels um, at least. One of the reasons the JPEG compression works so well with the previous image is because it had a lot of pixels to work with. So having this 5,000 odd pixel image and using that as its base to compress things work really, really well. So um, making sure you use a big image to begin with makes a huge difference in terms of um, having that um, ultimate image quality when you get to the end of, um, when it gets to upload it. But I would recommend starting with about 3,000 3, pixels and using that as your upload size. Most, but not all, most content management systems or web systems or um, social media platforms will reduce that down for you. Um, you can be aware if they don't do that, but most will. So start with the biggest images, biggest image possible. And always keep the original. Um, make sure that you always keep the original image just in case, don't throw it away. Um, it's too tempting just to work on something very quickly. Um, save it down and and upload it. That's fine if you think you're really not going to use it again, but I always find that I'll want to go back to that and we've resized it, compressed it, and it's a bit irritating. So it is worth taking that extra time to keep the original. Uh, naming images, I bang on about this a lot with um, search optimization, it's particularly useful. But if you are editing an image, uh, don't use the camera name that comes, that, that comes directly from the camera. Um, because it's not going to be useful to you if you're going to try and find it later. And it's certainly not useful from a search optimization point of view. So I always think if you've got an image, try and name it as you're describing it to someone over the phone. I'll give you an example. So this is a tabby cat in a wicker basket. So that's how I might describe it to you. I think it's a tabby cat, at least I hope it is, because I keep saying it is a tabby cat. Um, so this might be a good example. We've got this tabby cat. So we say, we call it a tabby cat in a wicker basket. Um, you really just want to describe it as you see it. Now, if you can add keywords in to your image, then do so because it may help them come up in Google search, but don't force it. Um, and always name all your images that you keep in your, um, maybe you've got a product library of all the images you're using. You maybe have a marketing asset library where anything, any sort of common images you want to drop into your marketing stuff. Make sure you name it there. Make sure you name it as accurately as you can so you can find it later um, because it's a real pain. Um, I've definitely had that in the past where I'm looking for maybe the robots that we use on our website. It's just trying to find the right one was a real pain. So you go through and name them and make sure it's done correctly. So naming an image, really important. Um, I know a lot of content management systems such as WordPress, if you just name the image without any hyphens in it, just spaces, as you can see here, tabby cat in a wicker basket. If you just name it like that, and upload it to WordPress, it will make everything lowercase, it will put hyphens in between, um, and it will also then put your full um, full name in the title. Uh, and then you can just copy and paste that straight into the alternative text tag, which tells Google what is actually in that image. So anyway, I'm not gonna dive into that too much, but it's really important to name your images as you're working on them. Okay, so I'm gonna get straight to the live demos. What have we got first? Cutting out an image and, um, color correction. So let's have a look at that one first. So now you're going to see my entire screen. So hopefully um, I've turned all my notifications off. So where are we going to start? Cutting out an image and color adjustment. Okay. So um, this is something I did recently actually for uh, Eclipse. Um, they wanted to add um, 
Aaron Kernahan, one of the directors, onto the website. So I'm just going to load him up there. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, let's just move it around. Do let me know if not, because I can't see any messages. So I'll just move that to the side up it. Um, they want to add uh, lovely cap, um, Aaron here to the website, but um, the image was just, um, it, it could have been a little bit better. Nothing wrong with the actual image, but the photograph taken was under office lights. They were a little bit yellow. So the image turned out a little bit yellow. So we need to compensate for that. Um, we also possibly just need to cut out the background a little bit so we can improve upon um, where we might use that. Um, I think they were using it over the top of their uh, brand color blue. So in which case we need to um, not have this, I don't know, muddy, whitey gray color in the background. So first things first, let's just color correct the image and just bring it back to where I think normal is. Um, I'm not a photographer, so I don't do a huge amount of this. Uh, there may be photographers among, among you who do a lot more of this, so forgive me, but this is just a very quick way to um, just check, tweak the color a little bit just to make it look a little bit more normal and compensate for the original light. Um, just to let you know, this program I'm using is available on the Mac. It's called Pixelmator Pro. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about it later. But it's a really useful tool. It's a very cost-effective way of just quickly editing photos. So I'm going to go to this little tool on the right-hand side. And um, under color adjustments, I'm just going to add the channel mixer option. And on this, what I want to do is, to me, if I'm looking at all the different colors in there, we've got red, green, and blue. I want to actually remove a little bit of the green, just a smidgen. And possibly a little bit of the red. No, actually, I'll leave the red. Green. Just to make it a little bit more normal for me. That's working a little bit better. Uh, just knock that red back a little bit. Just a tiny amount. Probably not noticeable for you guys, but it's just making um, Aaron's skin look a bit more like regular human skin. Obviously, if you've got to know who that, what that person looks like, or you're just going to just um, just things just to make it look right. But to me, it just looks a little bit yellow. Okay, so we've done that. One other thing I'm going to do is cut out the image. So I'm going to use this really cool tool that they've got in Pixelmator over here. And this allows me just to quickly select areas like this. So if I just click and hold, I can just run my mouse up. And what it does is it'll select different areas of color that are very similar. And I'll select that one section. I also want to add it onto this section as well. So if I hold down the shift button, then I can wreck in there. I'm just gonna push in too close, but not, not that close. I'm gonna bring the brush size down a little bit now and just fine tune these other areas. Great, a bit down the bottom. That's great. That looks really good to me. So it's cut all, most of the way around. There's just a little area actually here, just under his ear. If I want to be particular, I could go in and, uh, and tweak that. So I'm just going to zoom in. Sorry, Aaron. Zoom out a little bit. Um, what I want to do is just cut into Aaron's ear a little bit. And I just want to hold down Alt in this case. Oh, that's actually the wrong tool. I need to hold down shift and just cut into that where it was just a little bit too similar to his skin tone. Zoom out, that's better. Great. Now you could continue to work on it like that. I can notice a few other bits where it's actually cutting into his shirt here. So let's go in and we use the shift option here just to drag that along. Get that mask working perfectly. So now I can press delete and that knocks out the background. I'll deselect it and we've got Aaron isolated on a transparent background. That's what these little grids, uh, grid of black and white pixels are, just showing you it's a transparent background. So what we could do if we wanted to, we could add another layer into the background and I could make that a color. So let's pick, oh, um, let's go for a blue and we can change the background, or we could drop another image in top, on, the back, on the back as well. But I'm not gonna do that. We want to keep the background transparent. I do want to crop it though. So we'll go up to the crop tool up here. We'll go to square. And then I'm just gonna make sure Aaron's face is just centered in there. Nice. Apply that. And now we have Aaron in a square, ready for maybe a, a Twitter avatar or to go onto a website. Great. Um, and then we can go export for web. 
And because I want to retain the transparent background, I need to go for the PNG. If not, uh, then I could use a JPEG. So I'm gonna go for PNG in this case on my desktop. And I'm just gonna our own photo. Okay, so that's that one. Move on to now. What I want to move on to now is actually social icons. Um, I'm going to use uh, Eclipse again as another example. So um, with uh, I find I find with uh, Twitter avatars or Facebook avatars or any sort of pro profile icon that it's very difficult to use a, a logo that is of um, a non-square nature like this. This one here from Eclipse is is uh, something that's really difficult to put into a square because. Um, if you have a social media icon, you put this into a square, it's going to be really small on people's pages as they're scrolling through. So it's going to be difficult for them to notice you or recognize your icon. So what we want to do is tweak the layout of this slightly, specifically for a social media icon. Now, to do that, close this down. To do that, I've got a little template that I've made, which just to help with that process. So let me open that in Pixelmator. Great, blow that up a little bit so everyone can see. A little bit too large. Great. So what this is, uh, it's a social media icon. It's 500 by 500 pixels, and we have a circle in the middle. And the reason for that circle is a lot of social media profiles now use a circle, because actually it makes it, it works quite well, well with people's faces. Um, but often we might have, whatever we put in that square might get cut off. I'll show you an example of what that might look like. So let's take the square off for the moment. And I'm going to just load up the Eclipse logo into Pixelmator, because I want to take two elements from it. What I think with a square, what might be quite nice is if I take the main logo symbol and then put the text beneath it. So first, what I'm going to do is just use the select icon here and just drag over the symbol. Don't have to be accurate, because it will automatically crop to um, just fit around that particular image. So I go Command C go over to my uh, social icon template and paste. That's good, so I'm gonna leave it there for the moment. Then I'm gonna, gonna go back to the text, and I'm going to select, in fact, what I want to do is get rid of see the difference, because it'd be so small by the time we finish with it, that we don't need it. So I'll just copy that logo part there, copy, move over, and paste. Great, so we've got our two elements on there, all isolated, and we can work with them independently now. Let me shrink down a little bit. So what I will do is we'll move this down a little bit and shrink it to fit. Now that was good. And actually, this logo needs to come up a little bit. Now, really, I should be using a slightly bigger logo to work with this, but I couldn't actually find a big enough one to, to start with. But normally speaking, you'd want to use something that's actually much bigger than the, than the size of your thumbnail and resize it down. Um, let's just make that a little bit bigger, so smaller. It's fit in. Great. So what I've done now is we've got the, the symbol at the top and the text below. Now, um, let's have a look at what that looks like with the circle. In. Um, actually, I haven't got that. Let's turn on there. OK, so that's great. The symbol fits in, but actually the logo at the bottom, the text at the bottom doesn't. So what I'm going to have to do, I can't just bring it up because it's going to start getting too close to the symbol. So I just need to shrink it a little bit and drag it into the middle. You can see in Pixelmator, it's got these really handy guidelines. Um, I don't actually need all of those guidelines because it's saying, do you want to line, where do you want to line up with the edge or the middle of the page? To me, I want to line up with the middle of the page, which is about there. Um, so it's about even, nudge it a little bit. And then this, you might need to do it by eye because it's a slightly tricky shape. It's not technically a square. You might just need to, resize that manually. So I'm just going to shrink that down a little bit. Looks good to me. Forgive me if it's not particularly accurate. I would spend a bit more time on that normally, but we don't have enough at the moment. OK, then I can take that off. Now what we've got is our avatar logo, which hopefully is well spaced. It will fit within a circle if a social media um, profile determines to do that. But it's also going to look OK as a square. Um, we could put background on it if we wanted to, but in this case, I'd rather save as a PNG because then it might be more flexible for, for various different reasons. Um, again, we've got our profile icon ready to go for lots of different things. Um, if for some reason the, um, the service you're uploading it to um, 
didn't interpret the background correctly, then we may just want to add our own background on there. For some reason it might say, oh, you've got transparent background. I'm actually gonna make that transparent background. It might look a bit odd in your in your feed. So we can add on a background like this, um, go to fill, and I'm gonna color that in to the back. And there we go. So again, let's save that out. Um, PNG, and I'm gonna call that Eclipse Social Profile Icon onto my desktop. Great, that's that done. So that's really useful. And I think that the key thing here is making sure that A, that image is gonna look right when it's small. So even when we see it at quite a small size, in fact, I can't go any smaller than that, quite a small size, it's still going to be recognizable where something like this, um, if I open up this social logo, if you were to shrink this down, in fact, I can't shrink it any smaller than that. Can I do it with this one? If you shrink this down, it starts becoming less recognizable. So this actually helps to make it clearer, bigger, and more visible. Right, what's next on the list? Let's get rid of these. Um, Oh, I'll just quickly show you cutting out an image in this great uh, tool called PixelRx. I, because I've got a Mac, I often use a lot of Mac apps and tools, and that's why I share with people. There's a really good image editor called PixelRx. So here it is. Um, they have got an original version called Pixlr, but it's in Flash, so that won't work in most people's browsers. But they've got this X version. Works really well, I think. It's a really good tool for just general image, image editing. So um, let's just give you a quick example of how Aaron might look in that. So I can drag and drop Aaron onto this. Now what it's saying in here is that um, the original size, 5,000 by three and a half thousand is a really large size. So before we do any image editing, do we want to reduce that size down? Um, I would actually want to keep it at the max, which is 380, but for, for to speed things up, let's just do it at HD size. Um, so there's Aaron. And in this case, we want to click on the cutout. We want to use the magic cutout. And here, what we can do is just click on an area. And very similar to the brush in Pixelmator, but Pixelmator works better because it's live and you can move it around, see what it's going to cut out beforehand. But in this one, it's like, um, it still works in the same way. It's just, you don't know until it's actually cut it out. So I can keep clicking, cutting bits out until it's done. Ah, gone a bit too far. You can see there because the image is smaller and also this may not be as good at working out the colors. It's not quite got it right there. So I'm gonna undo that. And what we'll do is we'll use the brush to do these bits manually. You can see there's a few other bits to tidy up. So we select the brush and I can just brush over that and get rid of those sections that don't look quite so good. Particularly here. Give me, I'm just gonna do this quickly as well. Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, we also want to crop it. So I can go into crop mode. Um, let's see if we've got an aspect ratio one to one, which means a square. Yeah, that's center enough. And then I can just save that out as before. I can either have it as a JPEG, so it's gonna give it a background. In this case, it actually gives it a black background, whereas most programs default to white. So if you want to export it out, you're gonna make sure to add on the background first. Um, otherwise, go to a PNG and we can save that out as normal and download it. Um, it's actually a really good app. I think it's fairly responsive and fast for a web app. I haven't tried it on uh, an iPad, um, but on most computers I've tried it on, it works really well. And it's cross-platform, so it's gonna work on a PC and a Mac. So definitely worth looking at that one. Okay, next on the list, um, we are going to look at, um, oh, a social post. So we're gonna create a very quick social post using Canva. Um, I've often recommended Canva as a great tool for people to just create little bits of graphics and do some basic editing. Although actually with editing, I, I think Pixlr X is better now. Um, so what we want to do in Canva, I've already got an account set up. So that's probably one of the first activities you want to do. I want to create a design. Um, we're gonna pick social media and it's gonna come up with some templates. And in this example, I want to do a quote because lots of people use social media quotes. They might have a quote of the day that they're putting out. So in this case, um, I've got lots of different options to choose from. Um, I'm gonna go for this. And so really that template's done. 
is put everything in there. We've got an image in the background. We've got a bit of text, which is the quote, and then who we're attributing it to. So let me get my content in there. We've got the text file all ready to go. So select that text, paste in my quote. Obviously, Tony said that, which is great. Um, and then we want to set the image in the background. So I want to get rid of that, and I want to go to photos. I've got my own photos, haven't I? Uploads, here we go. So I already uploaded uh, a lovely picture of Tony earlier. So um, I could either use photos that are supplied as part of um, Canva. Uh, there's a lot of free ones, but you can pay for them through here as well, or various other different elements I might want to add. But I've already uploaded Tony. And what I can do is just drag and drop it straight onto the background. And you may need to do some adjustment in terms of um, whether that's the right image to use or um, if, you're, if you're okay going ahead with that, but I would say that's okay. Uh, and then I can actually download that image. So PNG, well, I've got different file formats here. Um, I don't have a transparent background. In fact, you need to pay for that particular version, but I don't need one in this case. Uh, and I'm happy with the file size. And that's it. We just wait wait for it to download, and there we go. All done. And then you can upload that straight to social media. So that's a really good way of uh, doing things. What you can do in Canva is then have saved templates or maybe reuse previous images. So if you didn't want it that particular size or you're doing quotes with different fonts, you can, um, you can change all that within this system here. So, for example, I could say I want this to be a slightly different font. What should we go for? Something crazy like Abyss. I've not actually used that one before. Lovely, can't really read it, but okay. Um, so once you set up your template, you can save that and then you can just reuse it and uh, just start from your same template each time, which is quite handy. So Canva is a really useful tool. I mean, I haven't, I haven't dived into it much in this particular example. It was just showing that you can actually set up a social media post um, quite quickly without having any knowledge of um, uh, image editing at all, really. As the final example, I'm going to show you how we put together our thumbnails for YouTube and our cover art for our podcast, because I think it's a good example of some complex uh, image editing and other things going on, which would be useful for people to see. So let's clear a few of these things away. OK, where do we start? So let's first start with the video thumbnail. So um, firstly, when we get our video back and we actually use the same webinar system that we're in now for recording, um, I get a video out of it. So I can actually download that video and I can scrub along. Uh, this was a recent podcast episode with Ben Everard. We're talking about the art of problem solving. And what I like to do for our artwork is find something that is interesting where we're both smiling um, and look like we're having a fun time. One, it's because when people are looking at the image, seeing people are smiling and happy, you may think, what are they smiling about? Um, but also you might be looking, it just looks more fun. You want to you want to listen to or watch a, a podcast that looks like it's going to be a bit of fun and a bit of interest. Certainly I do. So that's what I'm aiming for. Um, now I'm not going to be able to find the exact one uh, that I saw um, that I found before. Um, so I won't even try, but if you can't, so what I want is both people smiling and happy. Now I, I managed to find that in ours, but if you can't, you can actually just take two pictures. So you take one of um, Ben smiling and then one of uh, the other Ben smiling uh, Take those two pictures, you can bring them together. Now, no one need know that that didn't actually happen at the same time. But it's better that um, I haven't got a gormless face and Ben smiling or vice versa. So we want to make it work. So anyway, that's where we start. Just out of interest, on a, uh, a Mac to do a screen grab, you just need to, of, of this particular area, if you hold down Command, Shift, and 4, that's going to bring up a little um, crosshair, which you can drag over the image and create a screenshot that way. Or, as I do in this, Command Shift 4, I can hover over and press space and it converts it to snapshot that particular window you're on. So it's a lot easier. Um, but I've already got one prepared, so I won't use that. We will go with this image thumbnail here. So I'm going to load it up in Pixelmator. I've got a few uh, bits of overlay, which I keep um, in a template file, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, but what I want to do is if you, if you look at that image, it doesn't look quite right. 
I, I actually stand up now. I don't sit down when I do recording. So the problem is my head's touching the, the top of the screen, but Ben sat down and he's placed it so his, his face is in the middle. Now, I should have really asked him if he could move his camera down a little bit. So uh, we've got more two thirds where his face is at the top, um, but I didn't. So I've got to compensate that for that in the edit. Um, so what I need to do, I want to balance Ben up with me. So I'm going to need to cut him out. So I select the rectangular selection, I drag over, and I use command just to get a fine choice because it actually will select certain bits for me. There we go. And I can copy that. So command C and command V on the Mac will do a copy. You can also use these up here as well. Copy and paste. Com um, command C for copy, command V for paste. So now I've actually copied that on. I can click on the little arrow, select Ben again, and I can just make him a little bit bigger loosely so he's about the same size that looks good let's nudge it down a little bit so it's lined up at the bottom great that looks a little bit better so what i can do now is put on our standard overlay so i'll turn that on and what that does um, demio puts um these black uh, sorry white borders top and bottom i don't like that it doesn't look quite right um, when we're looking at the thumbnail in youtube so i put the blue ones on there it stands out a bit more and we put our podcast logo in the middle um that looks pretty good, actually. That works quite well for me. Right, right, maybe he was off too too far off to one side. What I could do is just nudge him in a little bit. And then I could trim back to find the middle and just cut out his section there. Yeah, that looks good. And so I'm happy with that. I want to upload it to YouTube. I can go Command E on here or um, File Export for Web. I want to do it as a PNG because that retains all of the um, additional information I want. And I export that out as video thumbnail or call it, say, Ben E video thumbnail. Okay, great. That's good. So that's done. That's probably the easiest one. More tricky one is actually to actually do the podcast cover art. So let me find in an array of all this stuff here. Um, here we go. So I've got my template for the podcast cover art. Let's open that in Pixelmator. So it's going to open up as a separate window. And I could copy and paste. Um, I could just grab, in fact, what I can do here is I can just merge these two layers together. So actually become one graphic, which is much easier to move around. I could copy that from here. I could paste it into this, just resize a little bit, zoom it down. Get it roughly fitting in the right place and then bring it underneath all of this other artwork. And we can get it to fit. The problem is our heads are right on the edge. So we'd actually need to chop a little bit out uh, from the sides to bring us a bit closer together. So that that's basically what I've done. If I just hide this one and I show these two layers, that's what I've done. I've sort of chopped, um, copy and pasted the bend section and moved it in a little bit and then copied and pasted mine section, and just cut it off. Great, happy days with that. Oh, and just with like the social avatar, I've got this circle mask that I put around the top because our website, um, when we upload this as a blog um, photo for, for, for people when they're viewing the blog, they can they can get a feel for who's, who's on each blog item. Um, it uses circles. Um, and if our heads were too fast, the edge are gonna get cut off. So I'd actually use the circle mask and make sure most of our heads are going to be in the picture. You'll also notice that, um, oh, you may not notice, but if I, let me zoom in, there's actually a little bit of um, gray at the top. To get me in the image and not have my head cut off by the circle, I've actually had to move me down a little bit. Now, in, that doesn't look great. Now, if I had a little bit of space above me, I could just stretch that a little bit, but in this case, I don't. So what I've had to do in Pixelmator, you can actually make shapes and rectangles. So I've actually put down a shape, a rectangle, moved into position. Um, I'll roughly get that right. Um, given it a gradient. And then on the gradient, let's sit here, I can actually um, pick the different colors for that particular gradient to make sure that they, um, they fit correctly. Now I will show you one I did earlier. And just by matching the gradient to the top 
of where my head is, it just about looks okay. And it's good enough because while at close scrutiny, that would look like it's been edited, when you're seeing it a regular size, no one notices. So it's always worth trying to do your best with image editing. But at the end of the day, if if it's just going on social media, it's going to be quite a small post. You don't need to worry about it too much, particularly if you're doing a large size to begin with. Um, same with this one. I want to export that out as a, as a PNG. So I would just select PNG and export. But actually, also for our, our email, we send out, I want to make sure that when this is embedded, there's a little image in there, that people know they can click on it. They know it's a video. So I actually have a little play icon in the overlay, which we can... Um, which I just got off, let me undo that actually, um, which we just got off um, the web. It's just a YouTube uh, icon that we can use and just drag that into the middle. And that, so that will always sit there and I can turn that on and off depending on how I want to export that information. So in this case, I can export that. And because I know it's just going in the email, it doesn't need to be the highest quality. I would actually export that as JPEG, 80% compression. And just export that out. Um, I think that is actually all of my examples I've got to show you. So we'll move on to the next section. I think that worked quite well. If you do have any other questions or if there's anything where it didn't come through very well or we need to cover um, different aspects of image editing, then let me know because it's this was a bit of a whirlwind tour through packages you may or may not have used, but hopefully a lot of those things are, the, uh, are familiar to you. So moving on, um, a key problem for a lot of people is finding legal images online. I know um, a few people um, that we've worked with have had problems in the past where they have used images that they didn't realize were copy protected and they have had a legal letter in the post. So my, I always advocate to try and make sure you either pay for the image or check that you can have it legally for commercial use as well. So here's a couple of tools. Um, I've mentioned them before to lots of people, but I'll whip, whip through them quickly. We've got Pexels, or Plexels as I keep calling it, but it's pexels.com. This is free. Um, you don't need to sign up generally, but if you want the higher quality versions, then it's worth getting an account on there. Um, that's a nice little tool, very good. The other one is Pixabay. And to be honest, I, I use them interchangeably. Um, I don't necessarily think one is better than the other. I'll tend to use one. If I don't find what I'm looking for, I use the other. Um, I'm quite happy to pay for images, but for some things where you're just mocking stuff up very quickly or you're, you're using it for sort of almost throwaway social posts, then, or something funny uh, for presentations, then these are great. Um, again, Pixel Bay is free as well. So that's pexels.com and pixabay.com. Um, oh, yeah, importantly, on both of them, uh, and this applies to anywhere where you get an image from, do check the license. Make sure, A, it's free to use if you're looking for a free image, and it's free for commercial use. Now, Pixabay and Pexels both say that. So if you click in an image, you'll see somewhere what the actual license is for the image. And in this case, it's great because it says it's free for commercial use, so you can make money out of it. You can remix it and reuse it in different ways. Um, and no attribution is required. So I don't actually need to tell anyone where that image comes from or how I used it. I do like to do that though. I think it's nice if we're using it in a blog post header, for example, to accompany a podcast, then um, it's really nice to put a link back to this image, but you don't need to do that. So they're two great places. Um, another interesting place, and I used to use this a lot before I found Pexels and um, Pixabay is Flickr. Now Flickr is a, like a photo sharing tool. It's been around for years. Um, it was owned by Yahoo, but it's uh, more recently split out. Um, the thing I like about Flickr is it tends to have lots of just casual, more casual photographs, more normal. If I wanted something that isn't too professional, isn't too good, actually Flickr is, is the right place for that. Now I'm not saying that Flickr doesn't have good images on it, it does. The problem is, if I want to use images on there without seeking permission, then I need to make sure, again, the license is for commercial use. So, um, and when you do that, the risk, it really restricts down the amount of images that you can actually use. So it's worthwhile, once you've searched, making sure you select, um, you've got to the license section, which is on the left, and you select commercial use allowed, um, which is perfect. Now, actually, there's another option here, commercial use and mods allowed. So if you want to modify it in any way, um, you can do that. I think you can do anything with the image um, as long as it's uh, linked to commercial use, as long as you don't sell it again. 
I think that will be restricted. And obviously, they still hold the rights to it. They just allow you to use it. Um, so that's a really good source, actually. If you exhaust Pixabay and Pex, Plex, Pexels, uh, do ch check out Flickr. But make sure commercial use is allowed on there, definitely. Um, we didn't haven't talked much about animated GIFs. And actually, um, I spoke to a client recently about um, having an animated GIF in their email, and it would be actually be a good uh, use of our time to go through it as part of our IMC. So we may do that one day. Um, but Giphy, if you want to find animated GIFs, uh, you can quickly put into social media. Giphy is a really good place to do that, and they're free. Do decide how you're going to use them, because they may not be strictly usable um, for commercial use. If you've got an advert or something like that, you might not be able to use it. But if you're just using it on social media as part of uh, general commentary, then it's fine. Um, but just don't use it for anything where you're, um, you're really um, making money from it. Um, this is a, an image library that we use called Elements uh, from a company called Invato. Uh, it's about £14 a month, uh, and it actually contains lots of different stuff. Uh, it's got photo, video, it's got audio in here, it's got lots of templates, it's got graphic, as you can see, lots of stuff lifted, listed. Um, really, really useful. This is probably one of the first places I go now. We've got a subscription to it. Um, any of our coaching clients can use this as well, so they can, they can look through this library, um, pull out any images that they want, and we can... Uh, incorporate them into their website or social work for them. So that's really useful because you don't need to worry about the licensing then, it's just done. Um, I'd highly recommend people get this if, if they're not working with us already. It's um, a really useful tool. Something I do like as well, you can see on the side, you can um, filter by color. So you can say, I want a more red image or a blue image. You can also show, um, filter by isolated. So if you wanted to picture a woman on a sort of white or very plain background, then you can click on isolated. And that's going to make it easier for you to cut out and use that person um, as an overlay. Really useful tool. There are other stock libraries. We've used 123RF in the past. Um, iStock Photo, which is now part of Getty Images. Uh, also, if you have a, a Adobe license, you, um, Creative Cloud license, you can use Adobe Stock. So there are other paid options. We just don't tend to use them. I, I will exhaust the others first. If we need an image specifically, and it's only on those image libraries, then you may have to go to them. They've got lots of different options from buying per image to buying credits and then using those up. So I'm not going to go into them. Um, but I would look at the others first before you get into these. Um, some of the images, like with Getty, they tend to be, you know, they're really good and they've got uh, amazing image libraries. But I would reach for the others first if you can. Just some selection tips, because it is hard. But the best way, if you've got an image library or you're, you're trying to find images, is to um, basically look for things that show what you mean. Um, so if you've got on, on your website, rather than trying to label the point in text, you might want to show what you mean. So actually finding images for that's really useful. Uh, maybe a, having a product in action. So someone using a product will show how it works rather than you having to talk about that. Um, ideally, you want to evoke emotion. So including people is really good if you can in your own photos or from stock libraries. Having a picture of a person that represents your market audience can be really helpful because um, you can show the emotion that people should be feeling about your product. Um, it doesn't have to be cheesy. A lot of them can be, you know, like a smiling, happy call center worker um, on the contacts page. Maybe not. Depends whether that's right for your audience. But trying to evoke some sort of emotion in the photos that you choose is really helpful. But when it comes to selecting, do just draw up a shortlist. Don't worry about picking the, the right one straight away. Just ramble through, put the search in, try and refine it, ramble through, um, and tr make a list of the images that roughly fit. Use the light boxes or um, favorites or save searches if you can, just to quickly collate them or just copy and paste the link in the URL. Um, and... Uh, if you can, before buying them, they they often come with previews um, or samples, and you can just drop those straight um, from the web page into whatever you're you're using. Them maybe it's a, a keynote presentation or your website. Just use those previews, get a feel for how those images work before you spend money on them. Um, it's fine with something like in in Vato or Pe Pexels. You may as well use the image straight away. But uh, if you're buying an expensive image from Getty Images, you want to make sure it works. So use the preview ones first. Um, I'm just going to ramble through some apps. Some I've already showed you, some I haven't. Um, again, sorry, they're mainly for Mac. Uh, the first one is Pixlr X. I've already mentioned that. I think it's a really useful tool if you just uh, want an image editor that's handy. You can just find it on the web from anywhere. 
I found it really fast. It does some basic um, cutting out and montaging. You've even got some like, canvas style features in there where you can put text and patterns and other things over the top. Um, so I think it's definitely worth looking at. I think it's really useful. The other tool I, I haven't got here, but I often recommend to people is uh, GIMP for PC. But to be honest, I find that so overwhelming and difficult. I, I probably wouldn't use that unless you really need to do some serious image editing. Next is Canva. We've looked at that. I think it's a pretty useful tool as well. It is free, but there are paid options. Um, but I think for most people, they just dive in and get a few things done. If nothing else, it, it may just help you come up with certain ideas and styles. And even if they're not quite exactly what you want, looking through some of the templates on here may help you come up with ideas that you can then make yourself in other image editors. So just as useful template library, it's quite good. Um, Pixelmator, so this is the program I use a lot. It's currently, in fact, Pixelmator Pro. Um, it's 22 pounds, which I think is really reasonable. Um, it's Mac only, but it does work very well. Um, I do find if you want, um, if you're a proper photo, photo image editor, this may not quite be enough for you. Um, for some, there's some techniques that it just can't do. It have, I haven't really reached that. For me, it's great. Um, I, I use it all the time. I use a lot of it. It's brilliant. So that's Pixelmator Pro. Um, oh, yeah, this is the tool I use a lot. Again, Mac only, which is a bit of a shame, but it's called Image Optim. Um, and it is basically just this little program you can see on the screen here. You you load it up and you drag and drop all the images um, that you've edited, drop them on there, and it will remove all that metadata that you don't need on the web, that you may not want on the web, um, particularly if it's an image that's come off your phone, because um, it wipes out all of that location data, um, camera data, and so on that could be used to identify who you are. So it removes all of that, and it will um, pre it will set predefined compression. So if you want all your JPEGs at eighty percent, then it will do that. Um, it's really useful tool, completely free, awesome, love it. Unfortunately, they don't have one for PC. So other options for PC are this. Um, this is called Imageify. We use this um, for our WordPress sites. So we actually have a plugin uh, on on a WordPress site, which means any image you upload will actually be processed by Imageify and then compressed. So it means our clients don't need to worry about compressing all of those images first. They'll be uploaded into this and then compressed by Imageify and then sent, sent back to the website. And the nice thing about that, take some of the load off the website and it works really well. Um, so I like Imageify. It means you just don't need to worry about up, what size you upload things. You can take your 3000 by 3000 image, upload it in, and it's gonna compress it well, really well, actually. Um, you've got different formats. You can have normal, which is, I think, it just a little bit of compression up to ultra um, or aggressive, funny terms. Um, but this is the free version as well. So you can actually go and try it for free and you can just use the images here. They won't get stored, but you can use the images here, just drag and drop them on and it will reduce them down. Key restriction is it does delete them, um, which is probably useful, but also you can't upload large images. So anything over two meg is not gonna work. So if you really did want to want to use it, you can actually get a paid version for about four something a month, which allows you something like a thousand credits and it's a credit per image being pro image processed. So um, actually, if you've got a WordPress website, and you you rely you want it to run nice and fast. Compressing images is important. I'd recommend recommend Imageify for that. Um, it works really well and certainly worth paying for. Um, I'm just going to mention this. Now, this is probably a little bit too much for people, but if you have lots of images to process, this is a fab tool. It's called Retrobatch. Uh, it's about forty nine pounds from a company called FlyingMeat.com, very old Mac company. Um, and what this is for is basically you can chain together commands for processing images. So we've got a case here where I want to read a folder, which I think was my desktop, uh, or maybe this example, I can't remember. Um, I can't remember, maybe this is just an example on here. So we want to read the folder, we want to tweak the color, we want to remove the GPS, important, because we don't want people to know where our images were. We can even remove all the metadata. And then we want to write out the images as they originally were, plus we want to scale them and write out the images. So what you can do is process hundreds of images really quickly just by dragging and dropping them onto this and away they'll go and they'll, ch they'll chug through and, and, and process everything. Now you can do that in things like, uh, if you've got Photoshop, that will do it. Um, I just, I've actually got a license for Photoshop it, through uh, Creative Cloud, but I find it too cumbersome. This is great. Once it's been set up, you can save them and run them really quickly. 
Um, it's fab for processing things for uh, a website, um, maybe product images. If you've got everything processed, you can drag and drop them in here and it'll just sanitize them, clean them and get them exactly how you want them. Um, brilliant tool. I don't use it a lot, but when I do, I, I'm glad I have it. Um, and this is just a fun one, not so much of an image editing, but a really useful tool to determine colors on a, uh, a website. Um, this is just Mac only, and you can, it's a free tool that comes with all Macs called Digital Color Meter, and it just displays a little box on the screen, and you can hover your cursor over anything, and it tells you what the hex colors are. So if you ever need a hex color for something, because you want to enter that into your CSS panel for all those advanced um, website programmers, then this is a really useful tool for that. Okay, so we're gonna finish off. I'm running just a little bit too long, um, but those demos were pretty good, and they took a little bit longer than I thought. So it just in this um, last few minutes, I want you just to think about, you don't have to tell me, but it'd be nice if you did, just think about what you've, you can take from this. Is there any particular thing that you are doing in a different way, but actually what you've seen could be really useful and you might wanna do it that way. Um, just think about one thing that you can do differently or improve or some, uh, some idea that you've been given over the next 30 days and do let me know. Um, we don't have time for a Q and A, I'm sorry. Um, so we'll have to skip on. Um, but we do need to pick the next topic. So I need to share with you the poll topic for next month. And we've got a few things on here. Um, we could either do a WordPress walkthrough. Um, we could look at Google Ads or a blogging and content strategy. I've actually done that as a workshop. So we've got a really nice presentation to go through for that or something else. Um, so just... Go onto the, onto the um, pick the topic you want for the next month and choose that. I'll just hide that for a second. Uh, Nikki, uh, thanks, Ben. I'll use the Mac more. Oh, do. I know I know you guys mainly work on PCs, and a lot of people uh, will do, um, either just for compatibility with your internal office systems or, or price. It doesn't really matter. You know, PCs are great. But I do find the Mac for image processing, um, unless you're using Photoshop, it's just amazing. There's so many tools on there. And since you have one, you can use it for all of your um, image processing uh, because you've got a nice big screen, you've got great color accuracy, and you've got lots of really useful tools. Um, Paula, I pledged to learn how to how I could use Canva. I think it'd be really useful for you. Um, and you may find that um, Canva is a really good place to start, and then ultimately you may grow out of using it because you're happy designing your own stuff. Um, Nikki, Canva is brilliant, Paul. Yeah, I, I quite like Canva, and I would use it more if I wasn't so happy using Pixelmator. Um, so topic for next month, we've got, oh, right, Google Ads, but with pit, pit to the post with Google, with blogging content strategy. So that's what we're going to focus on next, um, which is really walking through how you might set that together. Thank you very much, guys. Um, if you aren't a club member already, then do think about joining up. It's only £250 for 12 months. Um, you do have access to the entire back catalog of all of our other seven, uh, now eight um, club sessions, all about an hour in length, um, which they're not publicly available at the moment. I'm trying to just figure out a way of easily getting them. But if there's any topic that you're interested in, I can make sure you can get a link to that. Um, if you're interested in finding out more, contact me, hello at ratherinventive.com or check out our Inventive People page. Um, and... I just want to say thank you. Our next club session is on the 24th of September. So thank you very much, guys. Uh, just a final question from Paula. How do I put an image up here? Um, I don't think you can. <laughs> I'm not actually sure. I'm not uh, using the chat room. I'm not sure how you actually upload files onto it. So if you want to send me a picture, just send it to hello at ratherinventive.com and I can see it that way. Um, thanks very much, guys. Um, pleasure seeing you. And we'll be returning to our usual time next month. Cheers. Bye-bye.